Hi and welcome to another edition of the Page One podcast. You've just heard an advert there for our notebook, Page One, which is coming soon to Kickstarter. The link's in the bio, so please do check that out. But who's on the podcast this week, Tarek? This week we have Roz Watkins, a crime author whose first book, The Devil's Dice, uh, was a kind of mashup between uh, Broadchurch and Happy Valley with a female detective investigating a grisly murder or series of murders. Series of murder, exactly. Yeah, it's a really good book. I, I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, no, it was. It was really good, and it had more to say than your standard mm. police procedural, I think. And that's something that we discussed with Rose in the podcast. We spoke to Rose on Skype, and when we dialed in, she had a rather interesting Skype profile picture. <laughs> so we we discussed that at the start of the podcast. So anyway, we'll be back at the end of the podcast to chat a bit more. But until then, let's go to the podcast. Um, before we before we go on, I'm just looking at your Skype picture, and you're holding. A, is that a machine gun? <laughs> oh yes, I remember which one I use now. Yeah, it was when um, I managed to go for a little visit to the local police. Ah, All right. <laughs> oh, right, research purposes. Yeah, so it's not my uh, personal machine gun. <laughs> so I, I think uh, you you started as a patent attorney. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So I, I mean, I'm sort of the last person anyone would, would really expect to have ended up being an author because I um, was more sort of into science and maths at school. Um, although I did like English, but I got kind of pushed in the direction of science and maths, I suppose. Um, and yeah, I was patent attorney for 15 years. So I, I was writing, but it was all kind of legal and technical writing. Mm-hmm. Um, nothing sort of very creative. So I basically hadn't written anything, um, hadn't written any fiction since school. Um, And just the urge kind of came upon me about sort of five or six years ago. Um, I'd I'd, I'd managed to escape the patent attorney job um, because, I mean, really 15 years was enough for me. Um, And I'd bought some holiday cottages with my partner um, and we were renovating those and I was spending a lot of time sort of bashing mortar out of walls and <laughs> just doing kind of mindless, tedious things. Um, and I think that sort of got me, um, got my mind kind of going again. Um, so, yeah, I just had this urge to write a short story and it sort of all started from that, really. And was the short story, did that become the basis for The Devil's Dice or was it a completely different different thing? It, it was a different thing, but it did involve, it was actually, um, it involved some killer cows. <laughs> right. <which was laughs> I've not read a bit of them before. <laughs> yeah, I, I was doing a lot of walks with the dog at the time. And, um, <laughs> we did get chased by cows a couple of times. So, um, and I was doing a lot of animal training, sort of clicker training um, with the dog and with my horse. Um and I just had this idea about how you could possibly train cows um, to sort of accidentally uh, kill someone. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, yeah, that was it. I just had this idea on, on a dog walk, just came home, wrote it out. It was about a thousand words. Um, I had no idea what I was doing at all, but I, I don't know why, really. I sent, decided to send it off to um, an online competition. Right. Um, and it got shortlisted. So... I think that kind of gave me the encouragement I needed and I just wrote a few more short stories and it kind of developed from there really. Did you was it just as simple as sort of writing the short story and sending it out or did you look for input from anyone before you sent it out? Well that first one weirdly I don't know what came over me because it's not really like me at all. I I literally just wrote it out, read it through a few times and sent it off. Um but I think because it, it wasn't serious at all. It was just a sort of crazy thing that just occurred to me to do. Um, but once I got shortlisted for that one, I sort of started taking it a little bit more seriously. Um, I entered a few more competitions, short story competitions. Um, and I just joined a local, it was just a sort of council run um, writing group, really, in Derby. It wasn't great, but it, it just made me think that, yeah, God, I really actually love this. Mm-hmm. 
um, why have I not been doing this for the last 20 years? <laughs> well, so, well, we're both lawyers as well. <clears throat> so we know definitely the, uh, the hatred of the day job and wanting to escape to a world of writing. Yeah, I think it's quite a common thing that, isn't it? Yeah. And how long did you spend in the writing classes then before you, you went for your first actual novel? Um, it was, I suppose, there was a sort of six week um, course that I did, but I mean, it didn't, it, it didn't really sort of teach us that much, really. It was just an opportunity to get together with some like minded people and do some writing. Um, and initially, that just made me think, yeah, I enjoy this. And I started doing more short stories. Um, but I found with short stories, I found I couldn't I think the goalposts are quite hard to work out. You know, each competition is very different. I couldn't quite work out um, what it was about the winning stories that was making them win. Mm -hmm. um, and fairly quickly, I just started thinking, maybe I'll have a go at a novel. <laughs> How hard can it be? <laughs> <laughs> was it an idea that you'd had sort of bubbling about or did, did you sort of make the decision, I'm going to write a novel, what will it be about or... It was sort of in my head, but it, not really. I kind of, it changed a lot as I wrote it. So it started out one thing and then it just, as I kind of spent about a year, I suppose, thinking about it and writing it, it did change. Um, but I think with your first book, it's in a way it, it, it's sort of easy in that you can throw your whole life into it. So, you know, all the things I'd been sort of thinking about for ages, mm -hmm. I was able to explore quite a few of them in the first book. Um, and I used my day job. Um, I was able to basically kill off a few of my ex. <laughs> 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 Have a bit of fun with that. Um, but also, it, I think Meg went to Cambridge, I think, is that right, in the, in the novel? And is that, did you do the same? I did, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So, I, I, yeah, I did use um, sort of, bits of my life I mean she's she's not well, obviously she's not me she's got a very different childhood from her mind thankfully yes. <laughs> hers was horrific um but yeah I used some of my experiences um I quite fancied having a little trip to Cambridge in the first book because it is just such a great setting mm -hmm. um so I made the victim go to Cambridge as well um and I thought it'd be quite nice for Meg to go back to somewhere that she She'd been to university, so that sort of worked out. Um, and, and weirdly, it was one of the things that my agent said she um, sort of related to when she read the book was Meg's feelings of being stupid and um, the sort of imposter syndrome that a lot of people get um, at somewhere like Cambridge. Um, so I think quite a few people could relate to that. Um, and that that was kind of how I felt. So I, I <laughs> well, mind my, my own experiences for that. She she comes across as a. I mean, I th I thought that for all the characters, but especially Meg, because you're with her the most. She comes across as a very real person, and I, 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 that was yeah. maybe because it is informed. Okay, she's not based on you, but it's, you know these these influences from your life have added that that sort of air of reality to it. I think. Hopefully, yeah, thanks for that. I mean, I, I sort of used friends of mine as well and kind of I wanted her to be sort of there's a lot, you know, people talk a lot about strong female characters and I wanted mm -hmm. her to be strong sort of in the way that I think my friends are strong. So, you know, they're not out there kind of trying to hunt down criminals and stuff, but, uh, you know, they kind of prefer to have a nice cup of tea than confront mm -hmm. a serial killer. But if pushed or you know if kind of put in a position where they have to defend someone they love or something they care about they are really strong um and I sort of wanted her to be like that really so I mean she she is she's kind of much like stronger than me in that sense I can't imagine myself go, going into a cave and stuff you know <laughs> the underwater kind of hideous cave diving thing she does mm -hmm. I can't really imagine doing that but I sort of work out my worst fears and then I make lucky Meg. <laughs> 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 well, it was quite nice having a police story that you often have a male as the centre of it. And so it was quite nice having it from the female point of view, I thought. And I wondered, does, did you come up with the character of Meg first and then build the, that type of plot around her? Or did you 
know you wanted to write that sort of book and then place her in it? It was all quite accidental, really, because it didn't really start out as um, a police procedural. It was more of sort of when I started, it was more of a psychological thriller. And I was writing from the perspective of um, the victim's uh, wife, actually. Right. Um, But then I obviously I had a body and so I had to bring in a detective and um, Meg sort of this character kind of limped onto the scene and just (laughs) took over, basically. So she, her voice just seemed a lot stronger than the other characters. Um, so I ended up writing it all from her. Um, but I mean, I really didn't have a clue what I was doing. I was, I was, I sort of thought this would probably end up being my a practice book, really. So mm-hmm. um, I just thought it would probably be more straightforward to write it just from one point of view. Um, and I was just going, I sort of analysed other books and I read loads of books on how to write um, a book and you know, books on plotting and stuff and just played around with it, really. It wasn't, initially, it wasn't that serious and it just gradually got more and more serious as, as time went on. You said you started writing it from the point of view of the victim's wife initially. Did, did you, how far into the draft the first draft did you get before you just you thought hang on there's a better there's a better way to tell this story um i i know i did about i remember i started it on holiday i did about eight thousand words on holiday um and then came back and life got in the way because we were renovating these cottages and it all kind of came to a head we booked people into them basically and they were just totally not ready so it sort of all went a bit nuts and then i just put it aside for a while um, and then I think when I came back to it, I perhaps did another, probably another eight eight thousand words or so. And at that point, Meg made it obvious that it was going to be her story. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, at that point, I think the story was very different. Um, it, it did very much develop as I wrote it, um, and as I read more books, because um, obviously I, I, you know, I read tons of novels but I realized I had absolutely no idea how to put one together Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was reading a load of books on sort of um, basically how to do this thing Um, and that made me have more ideas about what things I needed to have in there and stuff about her past and all all that side of it so it was it was very much not well thought out it sort of developed as I went along really and I think more than may, kind of many books in this area, it, it has a quite a serious message, I think, in this one as well, euthanasia and how we treat people um, with illnesses. Um, there's, there's quite a, a serious message in there. Was that something you felt strongly about when, when you were writing? It was. I mean, that for me, it is important when I'm writing that there's something in there that, that fuels it. Um, mm. And for that, I... We we just been through something with my grandmother. Um, which, I mean, she was a hundred and one, so she really was ready to go. Um, but she didn't actually have anything terminal. She just kind of gradually just got iller and iller. Um, and for about six months, she just went to bed every day saying, "I hope I die tonight." Oh, wow. um, and it was really horrible uh, for my parents, particularly. She was living with them. Mm-hmm. Um, and my mum was a GP, so she did sort of say, look, do you want us to to sort this out? We will find a way to do it. But, of course, she didn't want them to get into trouble. Mm-hmm. So she kind of just kept going, and it, it got more and more horrific, and she couldn't have morphine because it made her sick, and it was horrible. So it was sort of anger at that, I think, mm-hmm. um, that fueled the book to a large extent. A lot of police procedurals are very similar and it kind of lifted it out from that. It, it stood out from the pack, if you like, as a result of having that more serious message. But at the same time, it wasn't just a book about that. It was also about the... It had your twists and turns and the usual sort of things that you would get and want from that book. But it, marrying the two together, which I don't imagine was easy, worked out worked out really well I thought it was yeah I think once I decided that that was really the thing I wanted to sort of provide the fuel for it 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 kind of came together really um and I 
I did want to put the other side as well, and that comes out, the other side probably comes out a bit more in my second book because, um, you know, although I'm very, I am strongly in favour of euthanasia, I also realise that there are concerns and especially, um, that's why I wanted Hannah really, the, the, the disabled character, to sort of put the other side of it. Um, cause especially, you know, with the government we've got at the moment, I can imagine it's cheaper to bump people off than it is to provide <laughs> decent care. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a bit of a worry. <laughs> and I think, um, throughout the book, you build up the tension um, and you, you pull the plot lines in together towards the end, but you, you, you're you really good at doing the tension build-up throughout the book and it, you kind of crank up as you go through. And when you come to plan that stuff out, do you sit down and do you plan out every step of the way or do you just kind of go for it and try and hit a few aims as you go through the story? I sort of did. I read a lot of screenwriting okay. books. So, um, yeah, I, was, I tried... Because I was very much aware that I was um, very new to this. And so I thought it was one of the reasons I thought um, once Meg kind of appeared on the scene, I thought writing it as a police procedural was probably quite a good idea because something that had a fairly clear structure. Mm -hmm. um, so I did try to go through and sort of hit those um, those kind of plot points um, and make sure I had, you know, important things happening um at the sort of times that the screenwriters were recommending um and interestingly in the book that originally got um pitched out it it had one less murder than <laughs> the final book and one of the editors came back and said oh i think uh, i think we need an extra an extra murder in here <laughs> more um, murder please yeah, which so I ended up having to add an add an extra murder, which was not super easy, but it it ended up bringing it closer to that the classic kind of um, you know the story mm. arc that that's recommended. So it was quite interesting that it ended up following that pattern quite closely. Um, I'm a bit less I sort of think about it that a bit less now, um, but I think when you know for the very first book, I think it was a really good thing to do. And I did work, I sort of had a, a plan of all my scenes and I'd go through and I'd, I'd make sure, you know, has every scene got something kind of interesting and something at the end that makes you want to read on. And I was quite sort of deliberate about that, I suppose. Yeah, that, that sounds like quite a, a sort of meticulous plan. Did you go back through Not it? Not really. No? <laughs> no. I, I, I kind of wrote a first draft first. Right. Um, or, yeah, sort of really, I found with a lot of the books I was reading, I'd perhaps read a book and it would be a bit ahead of where I was at that point. And so then I'd work on the book a bit more and then read the book again and work on the book a bit more and read another book. And every book that I read, I sort of learned something that I then fed back in. So I suppose the first draft took me about six months, but then I edited it for about a year. Yeah before um before i started submitting it and when you when it got to the stage of submissions uh how, how did you how did you go about that did you approach agents one at a time or or send a few out at once um it worked out quite well for me really because i had i decided i wanted to go to the um festival of writing at york right. um and partly i think because I'd, I'd read a, a book on how to write a novel um, by Harry Bingham, and he um, was involved in that festival. So that kind of made me realise was I didn't even realise things like that existed. Really, I saw it and thought, "Wow, that looks amazing!" I, you know, I get to basically listen to people talking about writing all day, and then I um, I can actually meet agents. So um, I booked in for that, and it gave me a one to one. I chose because I. The book wasn't quite ready, so I chose a one-to-one -one with a book doctor um, who was Claire McGowan and um, one agent. And um, Claire said she really liked my first chapter and she passed it on to her agent um, who was there, but I hadn't managed to get a one-to-one -one with her. But she actually then sort of approached me and gave me her card and said, send it to her when it was ready. Wow. Um, which was great. And then the other agent that I saw really liked it and asked me to send her the full manuscript. Um, 
and then it was also runner up in the first chapter competition so the agent that judged that was interested as well so it was um brilliant it was that's fantastic weekend. yeah that's yeah, that's an easier route than, than many people have <laughs> i mean by that time i think i had i'd worked on my first page so much i mean i entered a competition mm-hmm. My first page won me a critique of my first 10,000 words that I won in writing magazine. So I'd already had a critique um, and that was fairly a fairly brutal um, experience, but I learned from that. So I had had some feedback um, and I'd kind of joined, I'd, I'd formed my, write, my own writing group by that time and I'd joined other groups and I'd sort of basically got quite a bit of feedback um without really paying anything much I'd, I'd managed to get quite a bit of feedback by that time um and I'd worked on my first chapter a lot by then but yeah I, I, I did have a bit of a you know a sort of a lucky <laughs> break there I think at York it, it was great and my agent's brilliant and so yeah it all worked out very well is it quite important then, do you think, to, to have that kind of writing group where you can share writing, get feedback on, on your writing? Do you tend to share your, your first drafts with a lot of people as you go? I, um, I did for the first one especially, but I mean, actually, I think the, the support that I got from the friends that I made in the writing groups has been brilliant. Um, in terms of real detailed sort of critiques, um, I think the most useful thing for my first book was um, a website called uh, Scribophile or Scribophile. I'm not sure how you're supposed to pronounce it, um, but an online one where you can go on the, the website and you can critique other people's stuff and they can critique yours. Um, and because I find it quite hard in a group, you know, if you sort of got a writing group and you've got people all working on different types of things and, you know, people read their stuff out and you have to try and give feedback sort of in the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, that's really difficult. Yeah. Uh, whereas this this website, you could sit down, take your time, critique other people's stuff and you could sort of, uh, seek people that were writing stuff that you liked and similar books to you. And that, I put my whole book through that website. So basically oh, wow. the whole the whole book had had about six or so people critiquing it sort of word by word on this website. And is that, uh, do you have to pay for that site? Or is that, I've not heard of that one. There's a free um, version of it, which gives you a certain amount, but I did end up paying. It wasn't a huge amount, but I went for the sort of, the it, uh, yeah, I couldn't quite make it work with a free version. Um, but it, the paid for one was great. And then, um, I don't. I didn't use it for my second book because I just didn't have time to put it through that. Um, but by then, I'd made some friends on that site, um, and then we did some critiques for each other's stuff. Um, and I'd also made other friends locally who I then, by that time, knew well enough for them to read the whole book. Um, but my third book, I basically didn't have time for any of that, and it went <laughs> straight to my editor. <laughs> With, without anyone else reading it at all, even my agent, because by that time it was uh, it was all getting a bit more bit more fraught. Yeah, I suppose that's the that's the difference that you hear about a lot is the first book obviously takes people however long it takes them, but once you get a deal, the sort of commercial deadlines start to kick in. And it, did did that make it harder to to write, or had you already sort of? Once you got your deal, did you have a sort of idea of where you were going with the character? I um, didn't have much of an idea. I always admire these people who say, oh, yeah, I plotted out sort of seven stories. <laughs> like, I mean, when my agent said to me, oh, can you give us a couple of paragraphs about books two and three? I just thought, um, <laughs> <laughs> of course I can. Um, so book two wasn't too bad. I had I had this idea about this girl who has a heart transplant and starts seeming to remember things um, from her donor because I'd been reading about some case sort of case studies of this happening and mm-hmm. thought that was really weird yeah. so um, I had quite a clear idea of, of that or I mean it wasn't I wouldn't say it was easy but um, I think I partly wrote it on sort of wave of enthusiasm of just couldn't quite believe I'd actually got a book deal as well so 
I wrote it in the nice period between getting a book deal and my first book coming out. So I didn't have to cope with reviews or any of that. I could yeah. just basically get on with it. And that, that, so that would work really quite smoothly. But then when it came to book three, um, it just t- it seems to take me ages. Like, I don't really know why. I can't, I'm not sure. I kept sort of getting to about 40,000 words and then thinking, no, actually, this would be better done completely differently. So. <laughs> I just kept rewriting the damn thing until till my deadline, basically. At that point, it's just, right, I'm going to have to submit it as <laughs> it is. Um, so, yeah, book three was a bit of a nightmare. So um, to go back to the to the book festival and, and the writing festival that you went to, you, you'd submitted to some agents, and did you, the agent that you have now that you got the three book deal with is that someone that you found from that from that festival? yeah so she was um she was the, she was claire mcgowan's agent so um she was the one that sort of i, I did manage to grab a ten, 10 minutes with her and she read my first chapter said she liked it and um she she just said basically don't rush it she said finish it to a point where you you know you're really sure you can't do it anymore send it to me i won't forget <laughs> And so I sent it to her about three months after that. Um, and I sent it out to a few others that I'd met at the conference as well at the same time. Um, but she got back to me sort of fairly quickly. So um, I had quite a nice experience of being able to write to the other agents and say, oh, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> And then what was the process between once you had the agent to, to the book deal? How did that all work? So um, I initially just had a conversation with the agent where she gave me some thoughts and then I um, did some edits and um, then she did some more detailed comments, so about sort of eight pages of comments, I suppose. Um, there was one that was something like, can you just make it 20% more tense exciting emotion. <laughs> <laughs> sure no problem I'll just dial the slider up on the tension that yeah it was like if I could have done that I would have done it in the first place <laughs> exactly but generally her comments were very useful um and I sort of basically revised according to those that took about a month but it added to, um too many words so we ended up with 110,000 words which was too many so then I had about four days to remove 10,000 words, which was uh, quite challenging. But I'm yes. sure it made it a better book, but it was it was kind of like, you know, they say kill your darlings. Well, my, my darlings were basically bleeding all over the floor. <laughs> it was painful. That, that was the extra murder you had to go <laughs> Yeah, I didn't exactly. I, I, and then, yeah, when I had to add an extra murder, obviously I had to then get rid of other stuff, but... It um, definitely made it better. So then um, she wanted to get it. She wanted to start submitting around the time of London Book Fair. Um, so she said to me, "I'll oh, just t- like forget about this. It might. It, it usually takes a little while." So um, we'd actually booked a holiday. So I was in Venice, um, and I was trying to forget about it, as you do. And then about two days after she started submitting, I got this phone call saying that. Um, someone in Germany wanted it. So it yeah. actually sold to Germany first, which was very wow. strange. Yeah. And, and quite fast as well, isn't it? Because you know, I've definitely read stuff of folk taking months to try and find a deal. Yeah, it was weird. The German one happened so fast. I mean, she said, oh, we've had a um, an offer from Germany, a, a preempt via a scout. And I, I was like, I don't know what any of these words mean. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that... That did happen really fast, but it took a bit longer for the UK. Um, there was a very strange order that we got the deal in Germany first, then we got an approach from ITV, which was another one of those, like, seriously, wow. men in white coats yeah. are going to go and wait. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it, it can't, I just it thought this can't be real at this point. Um, and then it, it was about three or four weeks. I mean, I know it's still not that long, but it felt like a very long time. Um, yeah. No, I can. Yeah, sort of checking your emails every time. Oh, it's awful. <laughs> <But> yeah. <laughs> it's a really challenging time, but yeah, it was. Um, it was pretty pretty quick. So then we got the the three book deal um, for the UK. So 
It was good. <laughs> so the Devil's Dice got optioned for, did the ITV option it? Yeah, yeah. So it um, it got optioned and, um, yeah, that was that was a, all kind of just weird, really. Um, so it took, took quite a long time to negotiate that. Um, but, yeah, so that that option basically they they got a script writer and they um they've been pitching it out um sort of for the last six months or so we, we haven't no one's bitten yet but we've been fairly close apparently apparently very close on one occasion so uh man that'll be that'll be so exciting to see your own book turned into a film or tv show that would be absolutely fantastic. oh it'd be just be incredible and so i mean i know i shouldn't mm. get my hopes up because loads of books get optioned and very few get actually made but of course it's the first mm-hmm. thing that um most people ask you know that, that most people are interested in like my neighbors and everything <laughs> like is it gonna be on the tv and are you gonna take <laughs> who do you have in mind for the <laughs> Who, who, who's in mind for the lead character? I don't know, actually. Um, I, I, I really should. I mean, I actually had a meeting at ITV and they asked me that question. Um, and I said Catherine Parkinson, but actually that I don't know why I even said that because although I like her, um, she's not really what I imagine for Meg. Mm-hmm. So um, I don't know. I need to do some research. My, my partner's always suggesting... Um, actresses, but then they're, they're always completely wrong. He's got this image of Meg as being like really, really fat. <laughs> <laughs> like he's saying she's not actually that fat, she just thinks she's fat. But <laughs> the bigger the actress, the more likely he is to suggest her Meg. <laughs> How does it feel seeing someone else taking your story and presumably they're putting their own spin on it and, and stuff? How does it feel seeing these yeah. characters that were in your head being written by someone else? I mean, weirdly, they've not actually shared anything that they've um, created with me, so I haven't had that. Oh, right. yeah, it's, it's odd, isn't it? I keep meaning, I keep thinking, like, I really should ask to see some of this, but um, no, I haven't, I haven't seen any of it, so I don't actually know. I mean, I figure it's a good problem to have, really. Um, yeah. I mean, if it... If it got made and they made the character completely different and she was tripping around in high heels and, you know, just not Meg, then that would be not great. But I still think it would be a good problem to have. So Yeah, yeah that's true. Exactly. Yeah, you, you, you hear some of these stories about Hollywood, though, that someone pitches an idea and then, you know, if it was your story, they'd come back and say, right, we like Meg, but... It's going to be Will Smith playing, <laughs> yeah. playing yeah. Mike. Set in We've New York. Mike. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All of this sort yeah. of stuff. Just change it entirely. No, just give me the money. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then have you ever had a point where you're, where you're completely stumped with something? And I know you said when you're doing your third book, you kept, you kept getting stuck. But what's your technique to deal with problems like that? I tend to either go for a walk with the dog um, or I've got I've got a horse and um, we have to like pick the horse poo up from the field, which is fun. <laughs> um, but I find I think it's because it's so boring. Um, it, I've kind of got myself into a habit where it's almost like meditating. I kind of go out there, pick the horse poo up, and I just make myself think about the plot. Um, so that helps. Or sometimes read. I find reading books on writing because you know a lot of them have examples mm-hmm. from from mm-hmm. films or books or reading other people's stuff um i find can be quite helpful as well uh but i mean with yeah with book three i kind of kept having ideas but then i kept thinking oh no actually this next idea is better so it, that was a sort of weird sort of blocks it wasn't really a block so much as just almost too many different thoughts um Right. Okay. But I think I've got a better idea now of what I need, kind of, to make it work. Um, I'm hoping. Is it the murder kills? Are they are they going to come into book four? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've been thinking about book four, <laughs> so um, I haven't actually started writing it, but I've been thinking about it quite a lot over the last six months or so. Um, and I do think I have a better idea of what I need, but of course I've already put a lot of my best ideas into books one to three, so <laughs> it gets more tricky. And also with the scenery, 
you know, I just chucked it all into book one. We've got a, yeah. you know, we've got uh, all sorts going on. Um, is is there actually? I was going to ask that. Is there a cave system with some sort of maze inside it or something? It, it does that does that exist or is that something that you create? I did make it up, um, but there are similar kinds of things in the Peak District. So there's somewhere near me at Matlock Bath called the Heights of Abraham, um, which has got some caves. Which um, I went down. They're, they're sort of a mixture of lead mining and natural caves, and they're not that different. They're not as horrible as the labyrinth. Um, but they're not that different. So there are caves in this area that are a little bit like that, but I made that one up. It just made, made it a bit more unpleasant, really. And is crime something that you've always wanted to write? Is, is that an area that's always going to draw you in, or have you wanted to branch out into something new next? Um, it wasn't something I desperately wanted to write. No, I mean, weirdly, I don't read that many police procedurals, so... It sort of wasn't an obvious thing. I, I read quite a lot of psychological thrillers, but I, I read a massive range of things, actually. Um, part of it was I just thought I kind of like to have a, a goal, and I just thought if I'm going to have a go at writing a novel, I might as well have the goal of trying to get published. And mm -hmm. crime seemed... Um, I thought, oh, you know, if, it's, if I'm going to try and write something commercial, then let's say it's got to be like crime or romance, and there's no way I'm writing romance, so. <laughs> <laughs> let's kill some people and yeah i mean it, i think it does suit my nature to write to to write crime um but the police I well it, it was there at the start in the short story yeah the, the murder case That's right. exactly. yeah, i mean my favorite short stories were always things like the roll doll ones you know with a kind of really nasty mm -hmm. twist or whatever and they don't seem to be so popular nowadays which was part of the reason no. i moved away from the short stories and did you do you do when you're writing? I mean, obviously, you said you you threw everything you had, if you like, into that first book um, in terms of your own, uh, you know, patent attorneys and Cambridge and everything like that. But do, do you also you also seem to do quite a lot of research? I I thought came through, you know, with the probability, the Monty Hall problem, and things like that. Um, did you spend, or is that is that just stuff that you were carrying about in your head and you thought, I'll put that into the book that, as well? The Monty Hall problem was something from my experience, actually, because when I was travelling um, sort of after university, we were just in a bar or something backpacking and some strange bloke comes up and starts playing around with these cards and basically does mm -hmm. that exact thing. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm that I had the kid do um, with the two kings and an ace or two aces and a king, whatever it was. Um, and he started betting and I, I just kind of saw it for some reason. So I, I managed to win some money off this guy. <laughs> it was quite nice. So, yeah, I've sort of always been quite fond of the Monty Hall problem. Um, and I guess my background is sort of science, maths. Um, so I thought it was quite nice to bring something like that in that was a little bit different. Um, but it's it's quite hard. I'd like to be able to bring more of that sort of thing into future books, but it's really quite hard um, to actually make them work. I mean, I love those. I love kind of logic problems and, you know, those sort of lateral thinking problems and things like that. But it's not easy to incorporate them in a way that it, that sort of makes sense and isn't ridiculous. Um, my my dad uh, teaches maths and stuff, so I'd I'd heard of the Monte Hill problem. I still don't understand it, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I had so when it so when I started, uh, you know, before you named it in the book, I was like, is that, is that the Monte Hill problem? And then it actually gets it gets named. So yeah, no, I, I like I certainly liked it. That it featured that. Oh, that was good. No, it's not very many people can say that. <laughs> yeah, not many people recognise um, it. I'm going to ask a question that I think hopefully a lot of our listeners will be interested in, which is, have you been able to make that jump from working to becoming a writer full time? I sort of have, but it wasn't very deliberate. Um, it involved my partner walking out of his job in a fit of temper. <laughs> so, um, what what? What I'd done is I had managed to get out of the patent attorney job already um, and I was um, initially renovating these holiday cottages and then running the holiday cottages, which was um, 
you know, it was a lot of quite boring stuff, cleaning toilets and things, but it did give me time to write as a hobby and also to pursue other things that I'm interested in, like animal training and stuff. Um, so that was fine. Um, but then a couple of years ago, my partner just, I, I was happily cleaning one of the cottages at midday and he turns up and says, oh, I've walked out. <laughs> I, can't, I can't stand it any longer. <laughs> so, um, the plan was for him to go back to work and find another job. Um, but at the moment, he hasn't. So he's pretty much um, taking charge of the holiday cottages, which does leave me um, time to write full time. But sort of long term, we're not sure if we're going to make be able to make that work. It's a little bit precarious. You know, well, you know what writing's like. You never really know um, what the future holds financially. So... For now, I mean, I did, I did get a, a, you know, quite a decent deal from um, Germany. So for now, we're okay, um, and it's brilliant to be able to write full time. But and once, once Will Smith stars in the Devil's Day, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'll be made. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've always thought it is quite interesting that you know, writing a novel is something that you spend up to years of your life on sometimes, and yet it seems to be so hard to make a. Uh, a proper living yeah. of it, it, it's really shocking isn't it that how it, few people actually make a living at it um i mean i think i i could imagine sort of trying you know to add some teaching or um with with the holiday cottages maybe do some retreats with writing or something like that um mm-hmm. i wouldn't go back to anything involving law or um that kind <laughs> of <laughs> Good choice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, we might have to explore some other ways of bringing in some some cash, but at the moment, I mean, I'd rather just try and keep my expenses really low and um, have a, yeah. a decent life personally, which is what we're doing at the moment. No, that it sounds. Yeah, it is. It's always difficult getting that balance, and I suppose the trouble with writing, especially, is that it does take so long. Unless you're a sort of freelance journalist, although I don't think they get paid very well either. But you're not; it's not like you're producing stuff all the time that that money's coming in all the time. Okay. So it, it is a it is a difficult one. But um, yeah, those of us that like to write want to do it all the time. Mm. And I don't think I'm super fast either. You know, there are people who can sort of write two or even more books a year, um, and I yeah. I just find I mean the. You know, you can I can write fast, but I can't think fast enough to do mm-hmm. um, two books a year. So, uh, yeah, I I do think I need time to develop the plots in my head. Which, mm-hmm. I mean, one book a year feels like quite a lot. So, but I think I think I can probably manage that, but certainly no more than that. You said you liked uh, reading psychological thrillers and things. What? Who are your sort of go-to authors if you have if you have that, or or is it just more what the book is about that you're interested? In? Yeah, I mean, at the moment, um, I'm I tend to be reading a lot of um, proofs, so sort of lots of new authors. Um, but I guess my all-time favourites, pe- perhaps people like Lionel Shriver. Um, oh, yeah. So that not really psychological thriller, I guess. But I mean, we, we need to talk about Kevin just love that um and yeah. all her stuff actually um gillian flynn i really like um and quite a range of different authors really not not just within crime but now it's one of the things you don't realize i think that you um you get sent books which is a terrible problem isn't it being sent books, but <laughs> you then do feel obliged to read them and a lot of them are amazing um so that that's great, but it does mean that you you sort of have your reading um, dictated to you to a large extent. It would be quite nice to just go and read some like weird literary stuff or something completely different. Um, but at the moment, I've just got so many brilliant proofs being sent to me that I'm mainly reading them. So who who sends you the proofs? Where do they come from? Um, from other authors and um, some sort of through my editor. So. Basically, because, you know, because authors want quotes um, from other authors. So um, people were incredibly generous with my, well, my first and my second book. Uh, We sent, obviously sent it out to authors and we got 
loads of really lovely quotes from people. So obviously now, if any of them want me to read and quote on their book, then I feel totally morally obligated to do that. And they're usually really good as well. So, yeah, that provides a lot of my reading matter at the moment. As you see, it's it's a nice, a nice problem. It, it is, yeah, absolutely. it is, definitely. Yeah, and it's great to get to read stuff early on that, you know, you, end, that you love and it's not out for quite a while. Um, you said earlier that... Um, you, when you were starting to write, you were reading a lot of books on writing and particularly about screenplays. Would you ever want to write a screenplay or was that more for, as you said, the sort of learning the beats of a story? It was really more for, um, yeah, sort of stuff that I could put into novels. I don't have any particular desire to write a screenplay, no. Um, I don't think I watch, um, I, I haven't watched loads and loads of films um in the way that I've read loads and loads of books um mm. so it's I mean I, I, I like watching tv I like watching films but it's not really my thing in the in the same way as books are so I just found some of the screenwriting books have, have been just so incredibly useful um for feeding into the novel writing so um but yeah, I don't know. I don't. I can't see myself writing the screen. But maybe in the future. But it's not something that I've got a great desire to do. Okay, well, I think we've got a, f- a few kind of quick fire questions that we're going to ask you. This is just a bit of fun. So just the first answer that comes into okay. your head: line of duty or bodyguard? Bodyguard. Uh, TV or cinema? Oh, TV. Well, I, no, I'll say that. I'm a multiplex horrible cinema with someone sat in front of you <laughs> munching crisps came into my head, but actually we've got a really lovely little local cinema near us, which even it has, they have special dog-friendly screenings. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. So, yeah, I'll, I'll say cinema um, and think of that one. <laughs> okay. I have to say, I am a bit of a cinema Nazi and I, if I go to cinema, if, I like to have perfect silence, yeah. nobody on their phone, no moving. If everyone could just hold their breath for two hours, that would be fantastic. Yeah, exactly. I mean, why do they sell, why even sell crisps in Simpsons? It's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I think last time I was in this, uh, the last bad time I had was someone had an apple uh, and crunched their way through the apple through the whole film, which was oh, just incredible. It's like a, a shooting offence, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it should be, absolutely. <laughs> um, iPad or newspaper? I'm going to say iPad, but that's only because my eyes have started going. (laughs) The newspaper just gives me an image of, oh, God, that print's rather small. (laughs) A real book or an e-book? Oh, I think a real book, although I I obviously voraciously consume both, um, but I do like a real book. And last one, do you prefer to eat in or go out? Um, I prefer to go out, but we don't get much chance because we've got a dog that uh, really struggles to be <laughs> left on his own. So, yeah, I do like going out. And if you, if you tasted my cooking, you would understand that. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was a really enjoyable chat with Rose we had there. Yeah, it was. Uh, really kind of her to come on to the podcast. And I thought it was really interesting, you know, how much she valued competitions and getting yeah. writers' feedback, other writing group feedback and things like that. Yeah, it's funny. That's the second person we've had now have an unusual way into the industry. Yeah. And I've not heard of this site, uh, Scribiophile, but we'll put a link in the uh, podcast description and uh, so everyone can check it out because it sounded like it really helped her. Yeah. Um, please do remember to check out Ros's books, The Devil's Dice and the very soon to be released Dead Man's Daughter, which is another D.I. Meg Dalton uh, mystery. So uh, I'm definitely going to get that one. That's out on the 4th of April. So uh, recommend you pre-order that one now. Uh, yeah, and speaking of books, I've just finished reading uh, the excellent um, I'll Be Gone in the Dark by the late, great Michelle McNamara. Um, it's a true crime thriller about uh, the author's hunt for the Golden State Killer. 
a really, really good read. Oh, yeah, I heard about that, and they caught him recently. Yeah, that's right. Like I don't, I can't remember when the book came out exactly, but it was shortly after that that they made the arrest, and the guys who who catch him, they're involved in the, or they come into the story of the book at the end of it, and it's. It feels like a continuation of the story in some ways. And was that because of what she did in the book? So uh, a, a lot of it is, a, a lot of it kind of charts her involvement in the investigation. She chats to a lot of the detectives who are involved in it. And certainly the method that they use to catch him, they talk about that method in, in the book. So it, 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 it was a really, it's a shame that it almost came out too soon mm-hmm. for, in that sense. But it's, yeah, fantastic. Brilliant. Yeah, no, I'll definitely check that out. Uh, I've just started reading House of Leaves by Mark oh, yeah. Danielewski. I think that's how you say it. Apologies if not. Which is uh, really interesting. If, you, if you've not heard of it, um, it was released in 2000, I think, so it's been out for a while. But it's not just about the story, which already seems intriguing, but it's about actually how the book is laid out and written in the font. It's very interactive. I think it's a book where you have to like flick between different pages to work out what's going on. Um, not a book that I would get on Kindle, that's for sure. No. But I'm I'm looking forward to reading that. Yeah, it's a great book. I read it a few years ago, and I, and as you say, the the big part of it is the book itself. Um, you must have been a very smart man who bought you that book, Marco. Uh, no, very stupid, Tara. You got me. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the podcast this week. Next week, we're changing the pace a bit. We're speaking to a, a screenwriter instead of an author. We're speaking to Sergio Cashi, who is the screenwriter of films such as The Caller and uh, The Lodge, which has been getting rave reviews at uh, Sundance and I think other festivals. It's a horror film, but we talk about that next week with Sergio, so please do join us. Now, as always, you can get in touch with us by sending us a tweet to at right underscore gear on Twitter, or you can fire us an email to podcast at rightgear.co.uk. Thanks to Mr. Simon Stokes, as always, for your editing help. And now we'll just leave you with a bit more information about page one, the writer's notebook that is launching soon on Kickstarter. Uh, The link's in the bio, so please do check it out. If you're into writing or you know someone that is, then hopefully it'll be of interest to you. Anyway, thanks for listening, and we'll see you guys next week. See you. 